Hi everybody, this is the Hungry Math Professor here, and thank you for coming to my channel for this discussion. And today we're going to discuss a few books which look at girls and completeness theorems, because uh, you know now I've brought this topic up in two different videos. There's the discussion of the maniac, where the girls and completeness theorem comes up because it really affects John von Neumann's life, and then there's another discussion where. I looked at Journey to the Ed Edge of Reason, which is a biography about Kurt Gödel, and so of course his theorems come up there. And in this video, I want to dive into the theorems themselves and give you a few resources if you're interested in getting into the details at various different levels of of difficulty where you can go do that. So I'll start with the most difficult one, and I'm not necessarily recommending this unless you are a mathematician or studying math in a serious way. Um, and so the first one is what's it's called Introduction to Mathematical Logic by Elliot Mendelson. I like this book because I used it for an independent study that I did my last semester of college. This would have been fall 2009 at Messiah College. And there was this retired professor that had come back to Messiah to help out because we were a little short stats at the time. So that's Professor Gene Chase, and he was a professor at Messiah College, and then he was a professor at Dickinson College, and then he retired. He was a uh, mathematical logician and a really good uh, teacher, and he came back to teach a few courses at Messiah that semester, and then I got hooked up with him to do an independent study, and I would go to his office once a week and read part of the book and then discuss it with him, and I just ate up everything Gene had to say. I I just loved his passion and he had he was just so intelligent he had so much to say and I was just like eating every word up it was just such an amazing experience and so we went through this book Introduction to Mathematical Logic which is a very dense and very um detailed uh development of first order math uh, first order logic and then it gets into girls and completeness theorems and it gets into set theory um and it gets into uh, Turing machines and computability and things like that. So I, I don't necessarily recommend this unless you're really serious about studying logic. It is quite difficult. If you did use it, I would recommend you reading it with somebody else who has is a serious uh, in that way or find a professor that can guide you through it. But it is a book that meant a lot to me, and it's where my love of Girdle and Girdle's Incompleteness Theorem and Logic and Model Theory and Set Theory, all these foundations of math questions, it's where that all began for me. And as a professional mathematician, I went in a different direction. My research area is geometric analysis, and I really enjoy what I do, but I still have this love for Girdle's Incompleteness Theorems and First Order Logic, uh, Set Theory, and the foundations of math and philosophy of math that I just can't get away from. And I've become really obsessed with philosophy of math over the last year. So I'll probably do a few videos on that as well. Um, but I find this topic to just be so beautiful and it just feels like it's so foundational. It's like really touching the core of, you know, what it, what, what it means to be true in some sense, you know, and so it, it's hard for me to look away when I find this kinds of things. Uh, but again, that book is a little bit technical. So if you're looking to dive into the details, but you want something a little bit more readable and simple. There's this book um, called Girdle's Proof by Ernest Nagel and James Newman, which has which is edited and has a forward by Douglas Hofstetter, who's this famous author and uh, intellectual who authored Girdle Escher Bach, which is another good book. Um, but the, the, the advantage of this book, Girdle's Proof, is that, well, first of all, it, the whole book is just about Girdle's Proof of His Incompleteness Theorem, whereas the other textbook I mentioned is about much, much more than that. So this book is just about Girdle's Proof. It's written for people who have some, I would say, STEM maturity, but not necessarily like logicians or anything like that. It's it's trying to get at a general, more general audience. It's going to build everything up from scratch. And so if you're interested in understanding the details, this might be a good book for you to, to check out. And then the book that I want to spend most of my discussion today talking about uh, because it gets more into the philosophy, is this one, which is uh, Gödel's the Theorem, An Incomplete Guide to Its Use and Abuse by Torkel Franzen. And, you know, this this part of the title, An Incomplete Guide to Its Use and Abuse, what's that about? Well, I don't know if you've spent much time in the philosophy community or just uh, in general 
thinking about these kinds of things. There's this trend that people like to use. There's two things people love to use to justify all kinds of crazy ideas. And that is quantum mechanics and girls in completeness theorem. I mean, people love to use some of the bar bizarre aspects of quantum mechanics or the bizarre aspects of girls in completeness theorem without complete understanding what those things mean. So they're quite naive about their understanding in, in that in that uh, mixture of naivete and the just complexity of these areas, they're able to come up with all kinds of crazy mystical things that don't seem very, uh, you know, likely to be true in any sense. And, you know, they, they, they use these kinds of things to uh, justify relativism or all kinds of different things that I don't think it's justified. So I'm not going to talk about quantum mechanics at all here, but I do think there's a similarity at how people use these arguments incorrectly. But what this book is really trying to do is take that all head on and say, listen, girls in completeness theorem is beautiful. It does have far reaching consequences, but it doesn't mean all the crazy stuff that you think it means. And so, you know, a lot of the chapters are devoted to, I mean, the first couple of chapters are devoted to like explaining what the, what the theorems are, but a lot of the chapters are devoted to introducing you to some philosophical position and then telling you why it's not a good philosophical position. Right. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's very needed in the literature in some sense to try to combat all these bizarre ways that people misunderstand the theorems. But I will say there's some drawbacks to this book. Believe it or not, it feels overly technical at times, which it's a very technical subject. So, you know, maybe this is not a fair criticism, but I do think it's more technical than it needs to be at times. And also the other criticism I have is just that sometimes it spends too much time on arguments that it's eventually going to reject. And some of the arguments, I think to most, you know, uh, readers who understand girls and completeness theorem, these arguments are just clearly bad. Not all of them. Some of them are more subtle than that, but some of them are just clearly bad. And, and I just don't know that he has to spend as much time as he does on that. That being said, you know, my criticism aside, I think this book is, is generally worth reading, especially if you have the kinds of backgrounds you need to understand this book. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a dense book. It's not something you're just going to read through like a novel. Um, so in this last part of the discussion, let me just remind you of, you know, what girls completeness theorems are about and the history that they fall in. So when in the maniac, I discussed Hilmert, Hilbert's formalist project, right? So David Hilbert was this very famous mathematician uh, in the uh, 19th to 20th century. And he's famously, a lot of people say that he was the last mathematician who understand who, who understood all of mathematics. And that's a testament to how good of a mathematician Hilbert was but it's also a testament to the time period that he was in. Now mathematics has ballooned in such a size that even the most amazing mathematicians of the time cannot possibly understand all of it. So David Hilbert lived in a very, very special time in history and was a very special mathematician. And he released this project where that represented his formalist philosophical position on foundations of mathematics. And he said that he wanted there to be a one formalist system, an axiomatic system, which captured all of mathematics. And he wanted that system to have three properties. I'll just name them first. He wants it to be consistent, complete, and decidable. Okay, and this is like the holy grail or of formalism for the foundations of mathematics. So what does that mean? Consistent, right? So you have some system that describes mathematics. And for any statement you can make about mathematics, maybe just some statement about the natural numbers, you make a statement about the natural numbers. And now you, if it's consistent, you can either prove it to be true or false. You cannot prove it to be both true and false. Right? Notice if you can prove a statement to be both true and false, that's not good. That, that means that's not how true should work, right? You shouldn't have statements with are both true and false. So you want your system to be consistent. Every statement is either true or false. Consistent. Okay, the next one is completeness. So completeness, again, you have some statement you can make about mathematics, maybe about the natural numbers. And now you want to be able to prove that it is true or false. You don't want it to be the case that there's some statement you can make and there's no way to prove it to be true or false. So that's what it means to be complete. Every statement can either be true, proven to be true or false. There's no statements which are undecidable. And then the last thing you want is um, decidability. You want some like algorithm that can be used to um, 
decide whether each statement of mathematics is true or false. So it, not just that it's theoretically consistent and complete, but that there's some algorithmic way of making those decisions inside of the system. Okay, so that's Hilbert's project. He wants the system. He wants a, a one system for all of mathematics, which is consistent, complete, and decidable. And then, you know, Kurt Gödel comes along and proves his incompleteness theorems and shows that that's just not possible. That's just not going to happen. And so what does his incompleteness theorems say? Well, they say that if you have a system which can describe number theory, which if you're going to try to describe all of mathematics, you're definitely going to try to describe number theory. So if you have an axiomatic system that can describe number theory, then there's one of two possibilities. Either it's inconsistent. So there's some statement you can make which can be proven to be true and false. And this is awful. This is a nail in the coffin. As soon as there's one statement that can be proven true and false, there's something called the, the uh, blow up principle, which says that every statement can be proven true or false and the entire system is useless. This is terrible. So you don't want your system to be inconsistent. Okay, so then theorem says, let's assume you are consistent then. Then you are necessarily incomplete. Now, this is the better of the two options. And this is the, the world that we live in uh, at this point in history, or that we know we live in. We always lived in it, I guess, but this is the one we know we live in now. Um, and so your system is necessarily incomplete, meaning that there are statements you can make about mathematics in your formal system, which are undecidable, cannot be proven true or false. And again, at this point in history, I think the mathematical community and the um, set theory and logic community, we've, we've accepted this fact. I mean, it's true. We know it's true. So we've accepted it and we've made some peace with it. Though I think there's still like a lot of nuance and subtlety to it. Um, but, you know, being incomplete is is not what we what Hilbert wanted, but it's not as bad as being inconsistent. So, you know, we can we can live with that. Um, the other problem, though, is that Gödel's second incompleteness theorem says that no system can prove its own complete uh, can prove its own consistency. So, um, we never really know with any you know with any kind of uh, internal certainty that our system is consistent. But you know, we can believe that, and we can try to uh, give good justification for that but we can never prove it. So this is a huge deal. And at the time, it, it's like a bomb that goes off in, in the foundations of math community. Like, what the heck's going on here? And they, you know, I, I'm sure it, it caused a lot of ripples to go off. And 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 again, now in, in modern history, I think we've, we've made a lot of peace with this. We've had a lot of time to understand what this means. Um, but at the time, it was, uh, it was just, you know, revolutionary and, and shocking. Uh, in particular, like I mentioned in the Maniac discussion, it really shocked John von Neumann and really changed his life uh, from there on. Um, so let me just mention before I move on that you can still be a formalist. You know, Hilbert's formalism isn't possible anymore. This sort of um, all-encompassing system for mathematics in a formalist sense doesn't work. But there are still formalists. You know, people say that mathematics is just anything that you can prove from a system of axioms that is consistent and, you know, maybe humans care to study or something like that, right? So, or you could just say that mathematics is whatever follows from um, ZFC, which is Zermelo Frankel and choice axioms, which is like the accepted foundation for mathematics uh, via set theory today. So there's still ways to be formalist, but it's just not quite the formalism that Hilbert had in mind, which if that project was came to fruition, that would have really changed many people's minds and probably we would all be formalists, or at least it would have very much uh, affected our our philosophy on what mathematics is about, if that was possible. Uh, but of course it isn't. I just want to make a few more comments towards the end of this video now about Gödel's and Completeness Theorem's proof. Again, in the three books that I mentioned, um, you can find the proof in various different levels of detail. I'm going to say it in like a sentence or two, so very, very little detail. But the point is that Gödel shows that if your system can describe number theory, then you can create a sentence via his Gödel numbering. You can create a sentence which refers to its own provability. And this should make you think of Russell's paradox as sort of a self-referencing issue. And because this sentence that Gödel constructs 
can, refers to its own provability, you can show that you cannot prove it to be true or false. There would be a contradiction if you could. And so this is a nail in the coffin of, uh, there has to be these undecidable sentences. But when I described that, and in the community at the time, eventually people started to realize like, hey, is this just a technicality though? Like this girdle sentence is not very interesting. No one really cares about whether I can prove the girdle sentence true or false. It's a very beautiful proof. And I, I found this so beautiful the first time I went through it in college, but maybe this is just a technicality. You know, this girdle sentence is not very interesting. I think people had a similar reaction to Russell's paradox, but it turns out that, you know, so we, we were looking for a theorem that we could show is undecidable, which is mathematically interesting, right? If you can do that, then, you know, you've sh you show that girls and completeness theorem is not just a technicality. So what is a, what's a theorem, a non-trivial mathematical theorem that can be stated in, let's say, ZFC, the zermelo frankel choice set theory, uh, which is undecidable, right? And so one of the big ones that I really like is Cantor's continuum hypothesis, which is undecidable. We know it's been proven to be undecidable, and uh, half of that was done by by Gödel um, himself. And so what does the continuum hypothesis say? I'll probably do a video on the continuum hypothesis because there's no way I'm going to be able to give you the full understanding of it here. Um, but it says that um, we know that the natural numbers are a different size of infinity than the real numbers. Okay. And then the question is, if you take some subset of the real numbers, which you know, it must say it's an infinite subset, can, is it possible that that subset has a size of infinity, which is strictly between the size of the natural numbers and the size of the real numbers? I mean, this is a very natural question about subsets of the real numbers. I mean, this is a very clear mathematical question. And it turns out we cannot prove it to be true or false. We have proven that we cannot decide that statement. And so that's a nail in the coffin again, because now it's not just that Gödel's sentence is some technicality that we don't really care about. It turns out that it, you know, there are these statements you can make which are undecidable, which are clearly mathematical statements that that mathematicians would would be interested in. Um, furthermore, one thing that I learned from this from this book book by Turkel Franzen, which shows up in other places, is that you can also show that um, there's you can prove that there's always Diophantine equations. So these are equations in uh, para, um, polynomial equations in several variables. So equation like two uh, x squared plus three x plus four y squared minus seven y plus thirteen equals zero some polynomial equation. In that case, it was two variables. And I ask for solutions where X and Y have to be integers. So like numbers like one, two, three, four, so on, zero or negative one, two, three, four, so on. And um, those are called Diophantine equations. They're a very important uh, area of number theory that's been studied for many, many years in mathematics. It's a very, very old subject. And so Another example of these theorems, which you we know are undecidable, is that we can always we can prove that there in any uh, system of axioms where you can express number theory, where Gödel's incompleteness theorem applies, you can show that there are, is always a Diophantine equation that you cannot prove has a solution. And this is done by a diagonal argument, so we can't say exactly what the Diophantine equation is, but it's again, it's just this, another example of showing that. Um, you know, girls and completeness theorem is not just a technicality. It really is an essential feature of, of axiomatic formal systems. And so again, at this point in history, we've, we've made our peace with it. And, um, you know, set theorists are very much in tune and, and understand this and study it, um, all the time. And I'll let you sort of dig deeper into that. And I'll probably do a few other videos related to that. But again, thank you for coming and checking this out. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and I hope to see you at another discussion.